So the idea was to begin with the common stuff for the tablets this morning, CT scanning, how to triage, how to make them efficacious, so we can get to the novel techniques that Dr. Ng and Dr. Greenbaum are thinking outside the box and challenging us to, in the imaging world, to make it safe. Um, but we're going to kind of reel it back now to the common stuff, just the watchman, uh, and go through our experience at Henry Ford Hospital with the watchman device. So basically for atrial fibrillation, it's a significant disease. Over 5 million people in the country with atrial fibrillation. And anticoagulation, meaning rat poison, is something that you have to take to prevent the risk of stroke. Uh, 15 to 20% of strokes are related to atrial fibrillation. And the most common cause is basically a blood clot in the left atrial appendage that is just an outpouching of the left atrium that grows in the third or fourth week of embryonic life. However, uh, stroke has its significant consequences, and there's a 3 to 5 percent risk for patients every year over the age of 65 when they have atrial fibrillation of having one. And the mortality and morbidity associated with stroke from quality of life to actual loss of mobility is significant. And 30 percent of people become demented, and 23 percent have depression. So something that now we have commercially a device that's available beyond the Lariat too. This is a post-mortem cast of the left atrial appendage, and this is a problem with the left atrial appendage. It's not just an appendix. It has a lot of outpouchings. Um, about six years ago, radiology published that left atrial appendage can be termed a food. It's nicknamed the cauliflower, a chicken wing, a broccoli shape, a windsock. We actually debate that, and it's more like a fingerprint, because everybody has different angulations and outpouchings. Each of these little outpouchings can have a blood clot, and that will result in a risk of stroke. So Dr. Greenbaum showed this picture of what we're trying to avoid, but really it's what is the treatment goal for non-valvular atrial fibrillation or atrial fibrillation right now. And the main summary is medication versus intervention. The main problem with this is ER visits. Majority of ER visits on patients with GI bleeds come from Coumadin or anticoagulation intake when they cannot achieve a therapeutic INR or they're super therapeutic or sub-therapeutic because you have a lifestyle choice with this and lifestyle limitations with which you can take in for food. Uh, so warfarin use, you would think, should increase in patients who have an increased risk of stroke. If you're more at increased risk of stroke, you'll take the medication, so you'll decrease your risk of stroke. However, in patients who have the increased risk of stroke, they have multiple comorbidities. Their heart failure, they're sick, they're frail, they're debilitated, they have difficulty with compliance issues and difficulty with dietary intake. The compliance actually decreases in this population. And stroke is what happens, which is very debilitating. So what do we do right now at this present point? There's been devices that's been in development for the past 10 years. Um, the Watchman is a top center that you saw the film from Dr. Greenbaum earlier. On the bottom left is the Play-Doh device. This is the first initial version before the Watchman came onto board. And the bottom right-hand cluter is the Amplast occluder device, which is still in clinical trial study right now in Europe. All of those ideas are plugging the left atrial appendage so that any clot that occurs in the pedunculations or diverticula actually will stay there and not embolize out into the left atrium and up to carotids and cause a stroke. So this is what a lariat will look like on a cadaver model afterwards in a canine model. This was presented at the um, left atrial appendage conference in Germany in 2015. And as you can see, the last ring from the outside prevents any kind of formation of any <coughs> blood volume left inside the left atrium to left atrial appendage. With a Watchman device in a modified a canine model, when you put the Watchman implantation into an ideal left atrial appendage, you should have endothelialization. So the bottom right-hand corner, we don't know when endothelialization occurs. That's still under development. So sometimes they know at one year it happens, sometimes at 45 days. The 45-day arbitrary anticoagulation requirement by the FDA right now is not actually based on any scientific data, um, and it has not been validated. We don't know if 30 days or 46 days you need to be anticoagulation therapy <coughs> because we just don't know when endothelialization happens. Top left hand is what a left atrial appendage looks like after the watchman occluder is implanted in there, and you can see it bulges out. And the bottom left hand corner is a side splay open left atrial appendage. You can see the tines of the watchman device encirculated around the distal tips of the appendage and actually just burying itself in there. The problem is that we're stuck in time. The reason we're focusing on Watchman is it's the first commercial device that can be plugged for a, a patient. However, the background for imaging left atrial appendage is stuck in 2011. Doesn't seem that long ago, just be 2011. However, CT was not validated in 2011 for transcatheter aortic valve replacement. CT did not come into the wave until 2012. So FDA approval occurred for the Watchman device in 2011, and it occurred on two-dimensional transesophageal echo databases. 
to get FDA approval is a multi-million dollar clinical involvement and very costly for a company to invest in. To have a Watchman data set now be validated by CT and go back to the drawing board and represent that Watchman devices need to be implanted by CT is a significant investment that probably will not happen. So commercially, we're trying to validate that here at Henry Ford Hospital. So standard LAA device sizing is based on a pre-procedural outpatient two-dimensional transesophageal echocardiogram. And how it's approved the 2011 way is you have a patient come in from home, they're fasting for at least six hours, eight hours if they are needing anesthesia to help for support, and you take images at zero degrees, 45 degrees of the appendage, measure it from the actual um, Coumadin ridge, two millimeters down to the, where the circumflex artery is at to level the aortic valve. Again, at 90 degrees, two to three millimeters inferior from the Coumadin ridge and pulmonary vein junction down to where the circumflex comes off at. And then again at 135 degrees, so 0, 45, 90, 135. Five different measurements to find the maximal diameter of the true appendage. There's a scientific dilemma with this technology, though. We already know from TABR and transcatheter aortic valve replacements that you can't actually use two-dimensional TEE data sets because it undersizes transcatheter aortic valve replacements. However, we're still using two-dimensional transesophageal data sets for a Watchman implantation. So for the average number of devices per patient, it's about 1.7 to 2 devices per patient that needs to be used in the body before the correct device is actually figured out for that patient per procedure in the current clinical trial business. 2015 business model is three devices and catheters are supplied per hospital per patient. So that could be multiple manipulations in, say, your heart, uh, where we're testing devices three times before we find the right fit for you, which could be related to any time any kind of procedural risk and complications with catheter manipulations can cause uh, perforation. So we wanted to really here at Henry Ford Hospital evaluate the reproducibility, accuracy, um, and a protocol method for LAA sizing by 3D TEE and multi-slice <coughs> CT, because nowhere was 3D TEE also investigated. This is the current FDA insert for the Watchman. So they had the Protect AF clinical trial, the CAP, the Prevail, and the CAP2 clinical trials. If you look at the ends, this is over 1,500 patients that were studying these clinical trials. In red are the complication rates for these. Um, there was at least a 3% complication rate for pericardial fusion with tamponade requiring open heart surgery. There was device embolization. That means that the device was too small. It embolized and went to the distal abdominal aorta where a surgeon had to retrieve it. Uh, also surgical. There's also pericardial effusion that did not require surgical intervention but required prolonged hospitalization and some repeated ultrasounds for pericardial effusion evaluation. Cardiac perforation, which we mentioned again, is a separate entity. And also device migration, meaning the device moved out but didn't embolize the distal abdominal aorta, but it didn't leave and didn't stay in the actual appendage. All things that over 1,500 patients, sure, 3%, but you wouldn't want to be the next 3rd% patient. So this is one of the complications that can happen with procedural planning. So you have here a significant pericardial tamponade with a lot of blood and coagulum in the pericardial space uh, from pericardial fusion. This is not from a Watchman implantation, but this is something that we don't want to happen. So we want to prevent and anticipate before anything happens. So why is the LAA any different than TAVRs? Traditionally, left atrial appendage is under-respected. It's actually disrespected. It's the one that the cardiology fellows, myself included, when we were in training, loved to go to the EP lab and do a TEE for, because we were in and out. Was there a clot? Was there not a clot? I'm done. I can give my TEE report. I can do some other stuff. However, that's the problem, because we don't know how to visualize left atrial appendage. What we thought was appendage, we're not actually truly seeing. So it's not just about the size. Moving forward, there's some limitations. We already know that by transesophageal echocardiogram, the left atrial appendage changes by volume state and blood volume. So if a patient comes in dehydrated, which they have to be for the TEE lab and for cardiac catheterization procedure, they're not allowed to eat anything by, for six hours or drink anything like medications. And for a cath lab, they're not allowed to drink or eat anything for 12 hours. Um, we're going to really volume deplete them. And the left atrial appendage comes out from the left atrium, which continues with the mitral valve, continues with the left ventricle. When we dehydrate a patient, left atrium underfills, appendage underfills, so we automatically undersize, first thing. Second thing is TEE is actually contraindicated in the patient population that we're trying to treat 
for Watchman implantation. This is when a fellow is extremely happy seeing that a TEE needs to be done, but they had a GI bleed. They can pick up the phone, call the staff, and say, you need a GI consultation and endoscopy before I put a TEE probe down there. So the actual idea behind doing a preoperative transesophageal echo for Watchman FDA clinical trials and Watchman commerciality is very difficult because TEE probes should not be put into patients who have esophageal tears and relative contraindication with GI bleeds. This is a device sizing algorithm by two-dimensional TEE for the Watchman implantation. It's only by one dimension, it's a diameter. So there's five devices, 21, 24, 27, 30, and 33 device. And you can see the range, it's only by diameter, 17 to 19, 20, 22, 23, 25. And if I pull the room right now, we would get varying answers. Is the left atrial appendage round? Is it flat? Is it ellipsoid? Is it trapezoid? What does it look like? And the answer is they're all different. This is a very ideal picture of what a left atrial appendage looks like and how the Watchman device should sit, just like a letter T. These are the catheters that we can use to deliver the left atrial appendage. Top one is actually a single curve, middle one's an anterior curve, bottom one's a double curve that I repeatedly have used. Um, but you can see that the curvature is extremely different in each patient, but there's only three for our whole patient population, a one-size-fits-all model. So from May 2015 to present, um, all of our patients that were being cons considered for Watchman implantation underwent a CT scan for the left atrial appendage here at Henry Ford Hospital. They also underwent interprocedural 2D and three-dimensional transesophageal echocardiogram, and they also had a 45-day po um, post-follow-up CT scan, or sometimes more. And they also had a 3D print of the left atrial appendage, which is all this little white stuff you see there. Pre-procedure CT sizing, we went and took the maximum diameter, and we took the length by CT maximum di diameter too, and we used the Watchman sizing guidelines. We didn't do anything special, we actually just did math and did pi r squared. So taking the dimension of the Watchman device, having it in the radius, squaring it in times 3.14, we got a nominal area just like we would size a tab or a valve, an area for the valve. And we got borderline diameters. So our calculation for projected compression, which is what we want for the Watchman device, we don't want to be any more than 20% or more than 40% compressed, and we don't want anything under 20% compressed for risk of embolization. We took the nominal area of the Watchman device that we're selecting minus the LAA area that we obtained divided by the nominal area of the Watchman device. So very simplistic. Our CT scanning protocol, patients were allowed to eat. They were actually encouraged to eat. They were encouraged to just do their daily habit. In the morning they came to the CT scan, we actually gave them water and we had them drink the water before we scanned them so we can minimize any kind of atrial appendage undersizing. Then we did a retrospective EKG gated e um, LAA CT scan. It's just a pulmonary vein CT scan that's now gated. And what you can see miraculously and really creepy is the left atrial appendage actually contracts. On two-dimensional imaging, I have not seen left atrial appendage <coughs> contract like this before. So the left atrial appendage is a continuation of the left atrium. Why wouldn't it have systole and diastole? And in all reality, it does have systole and diastole too. We smart prep the patient at the level of left atrium using 120 pounds per units, and we scan delayed based on the patient's heart rate so that we get optimal filling depending if they were an RVR, rapid ventricular response, or if they were actually beta block in a slow response too. This is a computer-aided design virtual reality of what we want to do with this device. And the idea was to seat the left atrial appendage Watchman occluder device optimally to close the opening of the left atrial appendage. All of our sizing was done in end left ventricular systole. That would be left atrial diastole, so maximum filling the left atrium. When we maximally fill the left atrium, we're going to maximally fill the left atrial appendage. And then we went and did two case plans. So it really wasn't about sizing the left atrial appendage. It's actually a misnomer. For lariat, we size the left atrial appendage. So the top left screen is what we would do for a lariat. We find the ostium of the left atrial appendage, and you would want to put that elastic around it and suture it. If I was to do that with a Watchman device in the bottom left-hand corner mocked up to an extreme, I would actually go ahead and perforate left atrial appendage if I stuck to that landing zone on the top left image. So on the top right-hand corner is a CT scan and a modified two-dimensional CT of a three-dimensional CT of where the landing zone is actually going to be at. And it's basically like a jellyfish or a letter T, finding where you think the device is going to seat comfortably and block maximally all the pectinate muscles or the pedunculations while you have the maximum length. So on top left, you can see if we had picked that as our landing zone site and put a device in with the length needed for that device, the device would be outside the body and we would be part of the 3% for cardiac perforation. Simply taking it, we're using tabular technology for left atrial appendage sizing. Simply stated, left atrial appendage is actually more complex than the aorta. The aorta is just a tube. 
And I never thought I'd say the left atrial appendage is more difficult and more scary. But procedural planning wise, it is more complex than the TAVR because it's so personalized and individualized for every single patient. This is a CT case plan for the interventionalist. So most important for them is to see what they need to see in their world. 3D imaging is great, and we have a lot of software and a lot of virtual reality and augmentation and computer design, and we have color. But the reality is, in 2016, we're still de dealing with a 2D x-ray. So no matter what color we put in there, what transparency or um, funny vessels we put in there, the interventional cardiologist won't be able to translate that to their real workplace when they're actually in the cath lab suite. So on the right-hand screen is a mocked-up image of where the device should sit at, the length of where the catheter deployment sheet should be at. Top left-hand corner is the same C-arm angulation in the patient in the fluoroscopic suite. Bottom left-hand fluoroscopic image is actually the catheter with the watchman device implanted successfully. This is a case plan for the interventionalist. The imaging person is equally important because it's not just about landing the device at the landing zone and sizing, it's also about coaxiality. So in computer aided design, you can see where the left atrial appendage is at, but you also need to mock up the two traditional, two traditional views for LAA sizing. Bottom right hand screen is a 135 view of TEE. How do we get to this use of a 3D print? Repeated 135 views of the left atrial appendage and then looking at what it looks like on a TEE and taking that patient's 3D print and finding that same angulation, we were able to figure out, figure out what a CT rendering of 135 degree view should be on CT. Same thing with 45. 45 and 135 are picked because that's what the biplane view is. You add 90 degrees to 45 is 135. That way you get typically the maximum length and the maximum width of the left atrial appendage. You cover everything with that view. So our outcomes from May to February 2016, we've now, as of, um, it's already April, we've done 70 patients successfully now. For the statistical analysis, we've got completion up to 53 <coughs> patients. All 53 patients were successfully implanted in the Watchman device. There were four period Watchman leaks. Each of them were less than four millimeters in width. They want them to be less than five to be considered successful, so they are still successful. Two were anticipated due to potentiations, outpouchings that we saw that we just couldn't cover with the device. Two were secondary to device positioning that we couldn't control. So what does it matter about sizing? Well, you saw the tablet charts before. 2D TEE versus 3D TEE versus CT. You already saw that there's a one millimeter, 1.2 millimeter difference decrease from 2D to 2D, 3D TEE. CT was over two millimeters wider in the maximal width. That's over a device size change for these patients. P-value was statistically significant, 0 0.0001 for both 2D TEE and 3D TEE. So what if no CT was available? In Europe, they don't like to use CT because of radiation exposure for patients, so they depend on fluoroscopy 2D TEE. Well, we calculate a percent average upsizing that you can do. Compared to the maximum width of a 3D TEE image versus a 2D TEE image, you can upsize safely 11.6% from whatever maximum diameter you get without risk of perforation. Grain of salt is we haven't had a perforation yet, so we don't know our maximum. The 2D TEE, you can upsize possibly up to 20% compared to what you get on a 2D base measurement of the maximal one. Again, we haven't had a perforation yet. By a pair of T-tests, again, statistically significant, less than 0 0.0001. We're not able to assign a uniform correction factor for patients out of the 70 patients, primarily because everybody's appendage is different. So we can't accommodate for that. We can only give you a percentage. Left atrial appendage length. So the device, when you put into left atrial appendage, not only do you have to get the maximal width, you have to have enough length to deploy it or else it's gonna actually perforate the appendage. It's got teeth on the end of the device. If we were doing by a two-dimensional TEE, CT was larger than two-dimensional TEE still in significant less than 0.001 population. Why is that significant? Because two-dimensional transesophageal echo does not see the curves of a left atrial appendage. If you can't see the curve of a left atrial appendage or know to look for it by maximally antiflexing, retroflexing, you actually do what's called a screen failure on the table. Patient will be excluded from canopy for its device because they're too short of an appendage, but it was actually an underestimation. So is there a clinical impact and is there a need for CT? Well, we had no on the table screen failures. CT identified two patients with pre-procedure screen, screen failures. One, that the appendage is too small. One, that we did not have sufficient depth. Um, but on the actual day of the procedure that had a CT plan, nobody was excluded. So what if there was no CT and we used the CT data set that we went off of and just used our 2D measurements and 3D measurements 
These were all obtained when the patients had already gotten fluid bolus in the cath lab with an LA mean pressure over 10. And that's significant because we want that to be the maximal uh, gradient for the left atrium. If we didn't have any CT scans, by size only, two-dimensional TEE would have prevented three of the patients that we implanted successfully from getting a Watchman device. 3D TEE would have prevented three patients from getting a device. And that was one from uh, appendage being too small and one from the appendage being measured too big at the wrong site because we didn't know what to measure. On the bottom left-hand screen is a two-dimensional image of left atrial appendage at 4 o'clock. It looks very narrow, like a slither, and very tiny. In the middle is a three-dimensional transesophageal echo image of that same left atrial appendage. You can barely fit anything in there. On the far right-hand screen is the completed Watchman device put in there safely and completely occluded because CT said the patient could be done. If we were doing just purely by length, two-dimensional transesophageal echo would have screen failed or excluded nine of the patients that we have successfully implanted Watchman device in from ever getting the Watchman device. So that's nine procedures the hospital would not have been able to perform successfully to. Nine out of 53 is clinically significant. So what about the procedure cost, device, and savings? By two-dimensional TEE, we would have undersized device about 62% uh, 62, 62 of the time. I'm double-taking that because the number seems so big still. The three-dimensional TEE would have undersized the patients by 53% of the time. Um, we only had one time that CT had a sm uh, smaller, dev larger device by CT, uh, and that was because of device uh, positioning. So that's a significant change in device sizing in these patients. So I told you that there's on average 1.7 to 2 devices per patient used in the clinical trials due to device size uh, undersizing and inappropriateness. At our Henry Ford Institution, we only use one device size by CT sizing. Number of devices used is different. From the early clinical trials, number of devices used is 1.8 down to 1.5 to 1.4 to 1.5 to 1.4, all purely by, si uh, by size. Henry Ford, we're at 1.25 right now. But none of those were due to size, they were due to catheters and catheter positioning and coaxiality. So explain the 1.25. We mentioned that CT is about sizing the left atrial appendage. There's a second part about landing the device successfully. And the difficulty is that we don't have enough catheters for our patient's anatomy because everybody's a fingerprint. And it's very difficult to predict with our current imaging technology. So transeptal access is something that we didn't anticipate to be an issue. There is little data on what is the optimal transeptal crossing site for a left atrial appendage occlusion. By heresy, we think it's inferior and posterior, but we never knew why. So being cardiologists, we're cynical. We want to find out and test it out. So we did a sub-study analysis within our data set. Of the 20 patients that had gone under uh, Watchman LA implantation, we did 3D printed models of those patients. We 3D printed the models, had them ready for the day of the procedure, and tested the catheters in and out. So this is what Mike Forbes and Eric Myers at the Henry Ford Innovations Institute um, do. And this is a treat that we have at Henry Ford Hospital where we have an Innovations Institute as a 3D printer on site, computer-aided design on site. Um, and Mike and Eric have just basically embraced this wholeheartedly. What they have done is computer aid design mocked up the thickness and thinness of the left atrial septum, intraatrial septum. So in the green, in that triangular shape, is a true fossa ovalis. On TEE, we don't actually see that. We see it as a thin line. When you mock this up, you can find out where the thinnest part of it is. You can see the aorta left ventricle. And then we have an object 3D printer that we printed this off, and we cut out that hole with the fossa ovalis. Then we, in computer design, we had a three-dimensional graphic um, XYZ plan to see where the fossa ovalis is at in height. Is it superior or is it inferior to the opening of the left atrial appendage? And the bottom right-hand corner is the nine different patients' left atrial appendage opening. As you can see, it looks like a water slide coming down. All the fossa ovalis were higher than the left atrial appendage opening. None of our patients had a hiatal hernia. That would be the only exception because a hiatal hernia can push the left atrial appendage up higher. So in um, the middle uh, image in the computer design is actually from the septum looking into left atrial appendage. The turquoise letter I, the top part of it is in the left atrial appendage. The bottom part is in the mitral annulus plane. The mitral annulus plane is a reproducible anatomical site that we defined as our zero point for measuring to go high. On the far right screen is a fossa ovalis, and now we're looking from the 
uh, right atrium into left atrium, just at the intraatrial septum, and looking at the fossa ovalis, and where the center of that is at, again, to the mitral annulus plane. So very simplistically, we measure the vertical height from the left atrial appendage opening, center of it to the mitral annulus plane, and the vertical height from the mitral annulus plane to the fossa ovalis. And then we have fun with bench testing. So we took the device catheter as end device and tried to implant it into the Washman uh, to left atrial appendage. And as you can see, in this fossil ovalis here, the catheter is angled posterior to get the best coaxiality into left atrial appendage, the best center line to left atrial appendage. So nine patients had 3D printed models, and nine patients, all of them had a fossil ovalis that was higher than the actual left atrial appendage. By statistical analysis of the sign test, 100% of the cases, it was, should have been an inferior stick and a posterior stick, and a p-value is 0.01. Difference in the stick is one thing to model it, but it's one thing to see in clinical practice. We didn't care about this until we started having more device sizes because we sized it correctly, but then we had to use more than one device, and that was ruining my statistical analysis. So we had to go back and find out why that was happening. So if you take a look at the catheter positioning here on the left side, we didn't stick inferior and posterior. We didn't know. We stuck anterior because we just get across. And the yellow line suggests the coaxiality or the blood volume of the left atrial appendage and how our catheter is positioned. And you see that our catheter is not matching the parallel flow of the blood volume. On the right side, we had to restick the patient and put a second hole in the septum. And now you can see that the yellow line in the catheter matched the blood volume of the left atrial appendage and it completely is parallel to the blood flow. Why is that important? Because if it's a difficult stick like this case, we didn't go posterior and we're exactly opposite to the flow of the left atrial appendage, your device is going to have a peri washerman leak if not embolize. Again, you can see here, we had to reposition again to get a better coaxiality, and the first catheter, if we put a device in the left-hand screen, could perforate to left atrial appendage because you'd be sticking out completely to left atrial appendage and not actually to the true trajectory of the lobe, which is where the landing zone comes in. That's where part two of the case planning is important. So we showed you the case plan for the interventional cardiologist. This is the case plan that we generate for the imaging person. The red line marks the length of the deployment sheets of the Watchman device and where you should actually put it and how deep you should put it into left atrial appendage. This is what the 45 degree view and 135 degree view look again. So again, a prettier picture than what we actually have in TEE, but 45 and 135, and the far left is 45 degree, far right is 135. The yellow arrow on the right hand screen shows the, the angle that you want the catheter to be positioned by the case plan. However, you can see the device with the dotted line is actually not coaxial to that line. It's actually posterior and not anterior. This is a device in the patient afterwards, and it was extremely candid. The patient had a significant peri-watchman leak, and what you see, the device is completely on its side and perpendicular to the actual left atrial appendage trajectory. The peri-watchman leak here, as you can see on the uh, circle on the right-hand screen, that means that the patient is going to be uncoolant for a longer duration instead of the 45 duration. And whether or not the patient endothelizes, we won't know for sure with that degree of peri-watchman leak. Successful quick appendage closure is where you get catheter coaxiality in the lobe of interest with the depth that you need deployed. And you can now see the catheter at 45 degrees and 135 degrees with dotted lines. You completely to the trajectory of the left atrial appendage lobe. The patient had a good device. So these are the 3D prints of these patients that were difficult cases. And as you can see, um, well, not very clearly, each of the appendages look different. The green line, actually the angle, marks the curvature of each patient's left atrial appendage, and the curvature is different for each patient. Um, the bottom left two, uh, the bottom two patients are actually the easy ones. They are the ones that had a straight line and didn't have any significant curvature compared to the top uh, ones. Something you can see on 3D print, but then you can translate onto CT. So here the 3D print is teaching us what we need to do for CT sizing and how to size by CT. So our number of devices was due to catheter coaxiality. But what about the other results? By the Watchman clinical trial, there's actually an early Watchman device learning curve. So in the first time implanters, people who have not had any kind of clinical training in doing this device, there is a significant learning curve or what we call error rate that could lead to complications. So the far left hand of the screen is a protect AF clinical trial that Dr. Greenbaum referenced. In the first part of the trial, 271 patients had a Watchman device put in. In the first three patients, uh, there's 86% success rate, not 100% success rate. After they went under clinical training, got educated about looking at imaging and fluoroscopy, there's about a 91% success rate for first-time implanters. The complication rate on the far left-hand side for any kind of adverse events and pericardial fusion was about 16% in the first half of the trial. Second half of the trial was about 9%. 
The mean procedure time in the first half of the trial was 67 minutes, plus or minus 36 minutes. But the first three patients at each new hospital that was starting with the Washroom clinical trial was 82 minutes, plus or minus 40 minutes. So that's 82 minutes on a ventilator intubated on life support. At Henry Ford Hospital, we used CT. We had 100% success rate. Uh, we had no device complications, pericardial fusions or embolizations. And our mean time for the first three patients was 48 minutes. The p-value for our time was not significant because we only have a data set of 70 patients right now. But for our major adverse events, it was statistically significant. Major clinical events, as you can see here, pericardial fusion, tamponade, embolization, uh, pericardial fusion without any kind of intervention, cardiac perforation, device migration, device thrombus. The only one that we had was one device thrombus. We had no other complications compared to clinical trials of over 1,500 patients. So here's a case example of one patient that didn't have a pre-procedural CT that was actually done. And what you can see the difficulty is you just don't know what you're looking at. If you don't anticipate where the incubations are going to be at, you won't be able to see if the left atrial appendage is actually filled correctly. So here the watchman device is actually completely on its side in the left atrial appendage. And all that red flow is color flow, blood going through the device and going through the um, cloth of it. To get a better idea, this is the left atrium and the appendage, and the yellow is the patient's watchman device. It's completely opposite to the um, opening of the left atrial appendage and is not doing the patient any clinical benefit. This is a view of looking into left atrial appendage opening, and the device is completely canted on a site. And yes, it has that four millimeter gap at two, at two o'clock, but you can see all the wires of the device are exposed. So they're getting blood flow everywhere. So this was not a successful watchman implantation. Technically speaking, it was successful because the implant didn't embolize, but it's not doing the patient any good. So this is the benefit of CT, fluoroscopy, watchman implantation there. Bottom line is no two appendages are the same. It's actually more complicated than TAVR, and there's different filling pressures involved. The orifice is not round, it's not symmetrical. Sometimes it's actually elliptical, and we want to anticipate for success. So we really believe that a CT scan can be more comprehensive than the TEE, has better efficacy, can be done safely, um, and for the number of patients that have screen failed that could have benefited from this technology, CT would have prevented that. Thank you.